Hi, this is Professor James Cement. This is History US, US History 2202. This is week seven on the 1920s. just listening to is a composition known as Rhapsody in Blue by the great American composer George Gershwin, uh, composed in 1924, uh, is one of the great pieces in American classical music tradition. And uh, the reason why I played it, obviously, is because it comes from the 1920s, but also shows just how much jazz music, you can hear a lot of jazz rhythms, a lot of jazz uh, riffs in it. Um, how much jazz music, how popular it became, and how it, was a, it kind of was infecting all kinds of uh, art forms in the 1920s, including classical music. So today what we're going to take a look at is sort of the other side of the 1920s. Uh, what we were talking about before uh, in the first two lectures, what we were talking about the first two lectures was the enormous changes that were being brought into America uh, in the first few decades of the 20th century. Uh, we talked about sort of the, the massive industrial growth, uh, rapid population changes. America was becoming more urban uh, by the 1920s. Uh, there was also all kinds of changes in sort of the cultural life of America, uh, sort of the new modernism, as we talked about before, uh, new, sense, new ideas about what's moral, new ideas about sexuality, uh, just all kinds of changes that were sort of uh, uh, running through American life. Uh, new advertising, films, radio, all of these things that were kind of unsettling old values, old attitudes, old traditions. And of course, this rapid change produced in itself a reaction to it. Um, and much of this reaction was centered around, was based in small town in rural America. You know, we talked about earlier that 1920 marked the period of time when for the first time in American history, <clears throat> more people lived in uh, towns and cities, but that still meant that, you know, half of America uh, was 
uh, living in rural areas. And so what we want to take a look at today in, in this lecture is what kind of reaction resulted from all of these modern changes that were happening in America, particularly around sexuality, particularly around uh, all the, this new immigrant culture that was emerging, uh, the new uh, the new findings and new discoveries that science was making that was unsettling old ideas, particularly old religious and scriptural ideas about the origins of man and the nature of the universe and all that kind of thing uh, was being unsettled. So we're going to take a look at that. What kind of reaction did these modern changes in America produce in small town and rural America? What was the role of fundamentalist Christianity in this reaction? We're going to talk about this new religious phenomena that, uh, that spreads across the nation uh, in the early part of the 20th century and sort of culminates and uh, reaches its full uh, potential in the early 1920s. We're going to take a look, and we're going to use the topic of teaching evolution in the public schools and why it became such a hot button uh, cultural issue in the 1920s. Um, what triggered, we're going to take a look at what triggered the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. We talked about this before in the class and how it differed from earlier manifestation in the Reconstruction era, sort of the reaction to immigration. We've talked about this a little bit before. We might go into it a little bit more here. Uh, and finally, we're going, to take, we're going to sort of examine, you know, what can we see, what kind of echoes can we see of the cultural wars of America today in the 21st century? What kind of echoes do we see in the 1920s? Or rather, what kind of echoes of the 1920s do we see in modern contemporary America today? So let's begin there. You know, we know about these various cultural wars in America today, probably the most hot button of these uh, concerns abortion. So what is a culture war? Um, it, it is a, a war about an issue uh, in which the opinions are strongly held by both sides. Oftentimes these are polar opposites. It's kind of a zero-sum game. Uh, you know, those who uh, uh, believe in um, uh, that abortion is murder and stuff, you know, really ca almost cannot compromise because if it is murder, then it has to be outlawed. Those who believe it's a woman's right to choose over her own body uh, are on the opposite side and also have to take a kind of extreme uh, view that people should not, that, that outsiders, the government should not have a role in what a woman does with her body. And so you can kind of see the zero-sum game. It's very little room for, for compromise over the abortion issue. And that's typical of many culture war issues. It typically, culture war issues pit, pit traditional values against those who believe in progressive values. Uh, it, it, a lot of times self-identity is involved. People tend to uh, identify with the issue at a very personal level, so they believe that their own, their own value system and who they are as a person is at stake in this particular culture war issue. Um, and from the conservative side, a sense that a fear that old values and ways of life are being lost, uh, status is involved in, in, this, in these culture war issues. Um, and for those on the progressive side, you know, they, they tend to look at the conservative side as not, you know, not preserving old values, but clinging to old irrational ways of thinking that no longer have a place in the modern world. So that in a sense, uh, these culture war issues uh, uh, div divide not just about the, the issue itself, but are around greater idea, great, greater issues of, you know, who we are as a country. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, there's, there's a question of, of identity as a nation. Um, and culture war issues oftentimes get quite uh, exaggerated and inflated to the point where, you know, one side sees the other as evil or, 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 or you know, a threat to the very, uh, the very fabric of society. Um, and, so, you know, that, that oftentimes is the way the conservatives see it. And from the progressive side, the side that wants change, uh, they see it or wants to, you know, uh, uh, move towards more uh, forward-looking progressive values as they see it. They see the other side as irrational and stupid and whatever. So the, the particular issue becomes a stand-in for two very different visions of what America should be. And I, we can certainly see that in the abortion uh, uh, war today, the, the, the struggle over abortion, the culture war of abortion. But there are, of course, other issues. There's the issues of gay marriage, uh, issues like gun rights um, and uh, immigration, uh, the role of church in public life. All of these things are intense culture war issues. They're not around, you know, you can, one can debate about tax policy, you know, how much taxes one should have or, or, or what kind of government intervention in terms of regulation. Those are subjects 
to which people don't get as heated and as and as deeply committed to. They don't involve questions of identity, and there's room for compromise. You can have a certain level of taxation, you can have a certain level of regulation, but culture war issues are all or nothing wars, and they they deeply uh, affect people and who they believe they are, and, and and they deeply affect how people see the society in which they live and what kind of values are going to be are we going to live by, and. Today, of course, we said, you know, some of the big issues are, are things like uh, abortion. In the 1920s, there were also these culture war issues um, that were of great importance and divided society dramatically, oftentimes along urban-rural lines or urban-small town lines, in the same way that many of the culture wars today are, are divided along those lines. That, you know, for example, if you take the attitude towards immigrants today, there's a more welcoming attitude towards immigrants today in urban areas, whereas in rural areas, there's a more hostile attitude uh, towards uh, widespread immigration. And in the 1920s, so for example, in, in, in today's world, you know, abortion is the big issue. In the 1920s, it was birth control. Should women have access to birth control? Those who were against it believed that it would lead to immorality, uh, it would lead to sexual licentiousness, it would lead to a breakdown in all the old, you know, cultural values of America, while those who supported it believed that people who opposed uh, uh, birth control were living in the past, were irrational, they were stupid, uh, they, they ignorant, they didn't respect women's rights, that kind of thing. So it was an all-or-nothing culture war issue of the 1920s. Another one, of course, with the, another very big one was around prohibition, you know, whether uh, alcohol should be legalized. Even though it was illegal in the 1920s, you know, there were many Americans who believed that this was a mistake and it should be legalized. So there's a big battle over, over that and whether uh, uh, prohibition should be overturned. That was a big culture war issue. Um, another big uh, issue was immigration. Um, you know, whether uh, it was right for America to exclude immigrants or not. And was, were immigrants changing the, the very values and nature of what America was? That's an issue, of course, that we're still debating. It's a cultural war issue we're still debating today. But perhaps the most, the biggest of all of the issues, or the one that gathered, you know, kind of gathered the most attention and, and, and became the focus of so much of American thinking, was the subject of evolution. And whether, and more specifically, whether we should be teaching our children this theory of, of evolution. And here are a couple of cartoons from the 1920s, one on the side uh, uh, against the teaching of evolution to our children, and the other side uh, pro. And you can kind of see uh, the different values at work here. So, for example, on the one on the left, which is an anti-evolution or teaching evolution uh, uh, cartoon, political cartoon, you can see sort of a, the person descending from Christianity, the Bible is not infallible, um, and we'll talk about that, the idea that, uh, you know, people could start questioning the Bible, that if you went down that step, then the next step led to man not made in God's image, no miracles, no virgin birth, no de deity, no atonement, no resurrection, agnosticism, atheism. Uh, once you accepted uh, the idea of, uh, once you started questioning Christianity and the idea that the Bible is absolutely infallible, and of course if you accept the Bible is infallible, then there's no room for evolution. Um, so you can see the, sort of the descent of the modernists, and sort of the view that uh, once you take that road away from Christianity, it leads to atheism, and of course that will undermine the values and traditions of America. On the right you see a, a, a pro-evolution argument, and again you can kind of see how it's depicting uh, opponents of teaching evolution as and of course they're using uh, uh, monkeys because of course evolution was all about whether we are descended uh, from apes um, that uh, you can see here it's sort of the, 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 the people are, who oppose the teaching of evolution and of course we'll get to the Scopes trial in a minute um, you know are ignoramuses who don't want to hear the truth of science they don't want to accept it and so they have this classic image of the, the three monkeys speak not, hear not, see not so what you have in America in the 1920s um, are these sort of two Americas that are emerging. You have the big urban areas um, where people are embracing the change and accepting uh, uh, of the, the new the, these new values about morality, uh, new ideas about sexuality, um, you know, these cities that are full of immigrants, and then you get this reaction to it in small town America where people see America basically going to hell uh, and cities leading the way with their, their, their undermining of Christianity. Now, some of, you know, urban churches, many of the more progressive sort of liberal urban churches, and there were plenty of them, you know, were taking a different attitude uh, about science. And, and I want to sort of back up here and talk about, you know, that science uh, 
and, and the acceptance of science was a big issue in the 1920s. I mean, people accepted science in the sense of uh, they accepted the idea that you know modern medicine was was good for you and 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 you should uh, you know embrace that in your life. But the question of evolution and whether evolution undermined traditional values uh, was something that people debated uh, very strongly in America. But in the urban churches, uh, the more liberal urban churches, there was a sort of acceptance of. Uh, of science and a belief or acceptance of, of evolution in particular, uh, the idea that it, it could fit in with Christian uh, thought and Christian thinking. They didn't abandon Christianity, but they did believe that, you know, the Bible was something that was kind of a guide, but not an absolute truth. Um, as here, Reverend Harry Emerson Fosdick, a leading uh, a leading uh, a theologian and, uh, uh, and minister in, in New York City wrote, we must take the abiding spiritual values which inhere in the deep experiences of religion in all ages and give them new expression in terms of the framework which our new knowledge gives us. Science forces religion to deal with new ideas in the theoretical realm and new forces in the practical realm. So what he's saying there basically is that we must make room for new scientific discoveries. We must not hold to the app, what, what some people say are the absolute truths of the Bible. The Bible is really more of a moral guidance to us and that evolution uh, needs to be accepted because science has basically proved that it is in fact how human beings emerge and it doesn't necessarily push religion out the door but religion itself must adapt and accept these new ideas. On the right side you see Williams Jennings Bryan and we encountered him before of course when we were talking about populism. He was the great populist leader of the 1890s by the 1920s, uh, he had become. He was always an evangelical. He was always a, a strongly religious man, and he um, and he embraced the new evangelical Christianity. And part of that new evangelical Christianity was an acceptance of the Bible as absolute truth. That there was no there was no fudging it. There was no uh, fiddling with it. That that what it said in the Bible was the words of the Bible were literally uh, true. And part of it, part of his acceptance of this. Uh, literal truth of the Bible was this need to hold on to this sort of this this sort of anchor in a in a sea of change. You know, America's undergoing all these modernist changes, and holding to this absolute truth was a way for many Americans to kind of uh, uh, find them find a way to uh, stabilize themselves in, in, amidst all this change. And so uh, it, it produced in many Americans this idea that we we, we need to find an absolute truth that is unchanging. Uh, uh, despite all this modernism and these scientific discoveries, particularly around evolution, that we need to hold on to these, these absolute truths given to us by God and are eternal. And he writes here, our indictment is that the evolutionary hypothesis carried to its logical conclusion disputes every vital truth of the Bible. Its tendency, natural if not inevitable, is to lead to those who really accept is to lead those who really accept it, first to agnosticism, that is questioning whether God exists or not, and then to atheism, the absolute denial that God uh, exists. Again, going back to that cartoon that modernism eventually the even the questioning even one little bit of the Bible's literal truth will eventually lead to atheism and of course a breakdown of all morals and values that are based on Christian ideas and Christian ideals. Evolutionists, he says, attack the truth of the Bible, not openly at first, but using weasel-like words like poetical and symbolical and allegorical to suck the meaning out of the inspired record of man's creation. In other words, people like Fosdick were saying, well, we have to interpret the Bible in a kind of allegorical or poetical sense in, this, in, in that it's not literally true word for word, you know, that... that for example, when the Bible talks about creation, you know, these were people who lived thousands of years ago. They didn't understand modern science. They didn't understand modern archaeology. They didn't have any access to the ideas of Darwin and, and evolution. And really, he said, if you just interpret the, the story of creation as kind of a, a poetical uh, a, a poetical creation or an allegorical creation showing that, you know, God did create the universe, but not literally in six days. Um, that it was a long, gradual uh, uh, creation process. And what Brian is saying is, no, you cannot accept that, because the moment you accept that, you question the Bible itself. You question the literal truth of the Bible. And once you do that, you are on the path to atheism, and on the path to atheism, you are on the path to dispensing with all of the Christian morals and values that hold America together, that hold society together. And so this was this was the culture war of the 1920s, and of course, being America, it all ultimately ends up getting settled in a in a court case. You know, so much about America that we, when we 
are trying to grapple with these big uh, cultural decisions and, and other decisions, economic and political decisions, we oftentimes turn to the courts to resolve it. And of course, this was the case with the teaching of evolution in public schools. And the great battle over evolution uh, emerges in this, uh, in this small town known as Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. And it was really not so much about, it was partly about evolution, but it was really about the uh, teaching of evolution in our public schools. Because the teaching of evolution in the public schools meant that for traditionalists, for evangelical Christians who uh, were very uh, suspicious of modernist ideas, you know, the teaching of evolution was to corrupt our children, or to corrupt our future. And, you know, parents get very, um, very protective of their children. Uh, and so, people who were opposed to the idea of evolution, that saw it as undermining American traditions and values, the acceptance of evolution, that would undermine uh, the, the, the literal uh, scriptural, the literal truth that the scriptures are absolutely true, uh, word for word. You know, really worried that if their children were infected by these ideas in school, uh, it would turn them away from God, it would turn them away from religion and church, and it would undermine moral values uh, that they wanted to inculcate in their, in their children. So the case in Tennessee uh, involved a, a situation in the small town of Dayton, Tennessee, where uh, the, the state of Tennessee, like many other states, had passed laws in the early 1920s. Uh, in the case of Tennessee, it passed the law in 1924 that ban the teaching of evolution in schools. It's not like today where uh, the push among many conservative Christians is to allow for the teaching of um, Christian ideas of creation alongside evolution. This was a law that absolutely banned the teaching of evolution in public schools. It made it a crime for any teacher to do that. And so some people in the town of Dayton, Tennessee, um, uh, got uh, challenge this idea. Um, these were sort of liberal progressive thinkers who believed that this was anti-science, it was anti-modern, it was going to keep our children in ignorance because evolution was what science was uh, telling us, uh, was how creation occurred uh, in nature, and that by denying or, or by making it illegal to teach it, they were keeping Tennessee children, the children of Dayton, Tennessee, uh, in, in scientific ignorance or ignorance of science. And so they decided they were going to challenge the law and they got a hold of the uh, newly formed American Civil Liberties Union, which believed it was a, a, a constitutional violation of, 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 civil of, of civil liberties. You know, teachers should be able to teach uh, what they will and a school district cannot ban p uh, teachers from teaching uh, what they would. It's a, it was a partly a free speech issue, but it was also partly the idea that you were limiting um, you know, the school district was basically banning people from exercising their freedom to speak and think as they would, will, uh, violating the Bill of Rights. And so they decided to challenge the law, and they got a hold of a young teacher named John Scopes, uh, who was also, you know, a strong, uh, you know, uh, he was a, a young man who had studied biology, had been to college, um, and he had accepted uh, the theories of evolution as put forth by Charles Darwin, and he decided to challenge the law, and he, oh, and he, it was a, quite an open case. It was one of these test cases. It wasn't something that he did and then he got caught. Um, you know, they announced in advance that they were going to do this, and so they, in fact, uh, he went into the school in Dayton, Tennessee, the high school in Dayton, Tennessee, uh, in 1925, and he began to offer a class in evolution. He is then, of course, immediately arrested because he is, in fact, breaking the laws of Tennessee by teaching evolution in a public classroom. So we need to back up a second and sort of decide, and sort of examine why did, uh, why was uh, evolution seen as throat threatening, or the teaching of evolution. Now, of course, the idea of teaching young people, teaching children anything uh, their parents uh, objected to, and many people in Tennessee, this was in the heart of what's called the Bible Belt, a very, uh, you know, the uh, intensely uh, religious and Christian part of the United States, uh, mostly corresponding to the South and Midwest, um, where people held traditional values. Um, that they saw the teaching of evolution, of course, as infecting their young. But why did they see evolution as infecting their young? And of course, at one level, we all kind of understand that uh, evolution obviously contradicts the biblical account of creation. In the Bible, it says that God created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh. Um, and so, obviously, if if you know 
the evolutionary theory says no, no in fact, uh, life evolved over hundreds of millions of years. And so that right there challenges the biblical account of creation. But as we're going to see, evolution, as we should see, evolution uh, is much more threatening than just to a particular stories in the Bible about the creation. Because what, the, what, what evolution challenges is something much deeper and more profound than that. Um, basically, you know, according to the Bible, um, God is cre uh, excuse me, man, humanity is created in God's image. The humanity uh, is something is a special creation of God, um, and that this special place for man, that man alone among all the creatures of the world has a sort of a moral uh, sense to him. Um, they are, we are elevated above nature, we are separate, and all of human society, all of human civilization is rested on this principle that mankind is separate and distinct from the rest of creation, that we have this uh, moral compass to us, that we have values and traditions, we are not purely animals, we don't just live on our instincts, um, that we are above all of that. And of course evolution teaches, evolution teaches that basically mankind is not separate from the from from creation. We I mean we we are part of the animal kingdom, um, and that we are simply we have we have come to who we are as a species through you know the sort of the accidental processes of, of evolution. That it's simply a series of 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 genetic mutations, although they didn't really understand the concept of genetics in those days, but that it's just sort of this natural process that led to human beings, um, that we are not special, we are not different, we are not above the animals, we are not this distinctly moral creature, we are not created in God's image, and we are simply this accident of evolution, and if you accept that idea, uh, according to Christian uh, fundamentalists, people who accepted the literal truth of God, as we talked about uh, on uh, in the last class, then everything around it begins to crumble. And, and so all the morals and values that are based on this idea of man's special moral nature uh, kind of go out the window. And, you know, people who opposed the teaching of evolution in schools, you know, sort of looked around at society at large and they saw, you know, sort of new attitudes about sexuality, new attitudes about uh, women's place in the world, feminism that was emerging in the 1920s, um, the religious modernists who were saying, well, we have to adapt our understanding of the Bible to make room for these new ideas and make room for this new, this new thinking about where mankind fits into nature. Um, all of this, you know, uh, was seen as a uh, seen as an example of what happens when you start to undermine the literal truth of the Bible. Um, it also got tied up with economic issues. You know, many uh, many uh, people who oppose the idea of evolution in public schools uh, also oppose sort of all of the new kind of progressive ideas about government's role in the economy. They saw it as socialistic, and of course, socialism in many people's minds was equated with anti-religious attitudes, anti-Christian attitudes. Um, so it was all seen by those who were opposed to the teaching of evolution in school. All this modernism, all this newness. Um, was seen as an assault on tradition and mor morality and, of course, the Bible itself. And so Dayton, for, for many fundamentalists around the United States, many of these fundamentalist Christians around the United States, people reacting to the new modernism of 1920s society, saw this particular court case as kind of a, a stand that absolutely had to be made to, to prevent a, 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 the United States from slipping down the slope into atheism and immorality, which it was already on the way to doing that to deny the biblical story of creation was just the first step in this, this downward spiral that, that the American society uh, would be on. Those who supported Scopes and his teaching of public uh, teaching of evolution in public schools, you know, saw themselves as you know being the vanguard of, of, of a progressive movement to accept society, to accept uh, knowledge, to accept learning, um, you know, to embrace the modern world. Uh, they saw it as pro progress. Um, they saw it as educating our young in the ways of science was a good thing to do, that it would, you know, make our young people uh, uh, embrace other progressive ideas, that it would make them, you know, simply citizens of a modern society that stood by science and that accepted science. They also saw themselves, in a sense, as fighting against religious intolerance and ignorance. They saw it as, you know, the, the, what the, what the anti-evolution uh, folks were saying that these people were trying to bring America back to some kind of medieval uh, era in which uh, everything was, all life was dictated to by the church. And so 
the struggle over evolution was also a, a big struggle over, you know, what was the role of the church in society? Should it be simply something, you know, should it be simply something about morality and something on Sundays and preaching um, and, and teaching people sort of moral values uh, within the context of the church? Or should the church have an influence over all aspects of American life, including over our public schools? So the stakes in the, the Dayton, uh, in the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925 could not have been higher for either side. And because the stakes could not have been higher, both sides to bring out their both sides decided to bring out their big guns. Uh, those who supported uh, the teaching of evolution in public schools and those who supported John Scopes, uh, they recruited this guy, Clarence Darrow, and also, of course, the ACLU uh, uh, recruited him uh, to serve as the defense lawyer for uh, for John Scopes. And but of course, larger there in this case. Uh, was not just about John Scopes, obviously, it was a single particular case, but it was, the idea was that it was going to set this massive precedent that if um, one could undermine uh, this law banning evolution, one could undermine sort of the, all of this religious reaction, according to progressives and those who supported the teaching of evolution in public schools. Now, Clarence Darrow was probably the most famous lawyer in America at the time. Um, he was very much a supporter of civil liberties, was one of the founders of the um, of the uh, ACLU, and he was a leading defense lawyer in the country. He was uh, based out of Chicago, and he was actually quite notorious in America in the early 1920s. Um, while he fought many civil liberties cases, he also, but he, you know, he made his money as a defense lawyer. And in one of the most high-profile cases of the early 1920s, he had defended a couple of, uh, he had defended, uh, he had been the lawyer for the defendants in a, a case called the Leopold and Loeb trial. A couple of rich college kids uh, in the early 1920s who had kidnapped and murdered a 14-year-old boy for the fun of it. And uh, this case, of course, gathered national attention. It was a major trial. Uh, partly it was, um, you know, it was followed in all the newspapers and followed by the new medium of radio. And um, to defend these two guys, uh, Clarence Darrow used this new sort of, new, some of the new psychological thinking that we talked about earlier, that people are, you know, controlled by, uh, you know, their deep, dark urges within their subconscious. And he was able, by using this new psychological defense, um, to get Leopold and Loeb uh, not off. They, they, were, they were, in fact, commi uh, convicted of this horrendous crime. But he was able, you know, they were up for the death penalty. And he was able to sort of prove that they were psychologically damaged uh, by their upbringing and various things, that they were under the control of these urges. And so he was able to get their sentencing reduced from, um, from the death penalty to uh, life imprisonment. And many Americans, you know, many traditionalist conservative Americans were very upset by this because it sort of indicated, you know, this is where science leads. It, 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 it leads to questioning of, of moral values. You know, many Americans saw uh, Leopold and Loeb as, you know, under the influence of Satan and, they, and they, were, they were evil and they needed to be executed for that. And Darrow was able to sort of use this, this new psychological sciences to question that very idea and to sort of say they were they were not in control of their own actions and so he was able to get them this lesser sentence that offended many Americans and it also for many Americans sort of showed that you know science could be used to undermine moral values and of course that applied to the the teaching of evolution in public schools as we've discussed to match this uh, high powered attorney for the defense the prosecution in Tennessee uh, in Dayton, Tennessee, you know the 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 uh, the city of Tennessee, uh, city of Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, you know, they, of course, they had their own prosecutors in the area, uh, but they decided to bring in a, a, a very high-powered uh, uh, figure to do that, and that, of course, was Williams Jennings Bryan. As we mentioned before, Williams Jennings Bryan had run three times as a presidential candidate, been the leader of the populist movement in the 1890s and the early 1900s, but he was also a deeply devout uh, fundamentalist Christian. He had been a Bible teacher, and he is brought in. Uh, to uh, you know, prosecute Scopes and to defend this law against teaching of evolution in public schools. Um, he saw science and the ACLU and all these modernists as an assault, not just on traditional values, but he also tried to frame it as this kind of the elitists from the cities who wanted to impose their these modernist anti-moral attitudes on small town average citizens. Um, so he sort of depicted this whole uh, case as one of elitists, uh, intellectual elitists, you know, liberal elitists from the cities trying to impose their their views 
on good old-fashioned Americans who held to traditional moral values and held to the literal truth of the Bible. And in his, I think we can capture sort of his attitude in the closing arguments that he was supposed to make for the Scopes trial, but because, as we're going to see, the Scopes trial kind of ended uh, on a technicality, he was never able to deliver this. But I think this uh, closing argument that he intended to give uh, and then was provided to the press by his wife, as we're going to see, he dies shortly after the trial is over. Um, you can sort of see his attitudes um, about the teaching of evolution. And he writes, or he would have spoken in, in the courtroom, our indictment to the jury, our indictment is that the evolutionary hypothesis carried to its logical conclusion disputes every vital truth of the Bible. Its tendency, natural if not inevitable, meaning the teaching of evolution, is to lead those who really accept it first to agnosticism and then to atheism. Again, that's the quote we were looked at before. And so what Brian is arguing is this attitude that God is absolute. That, that, that God created the universe and he can do anything he wants to it, that the miracles are true, that everything about that is said in the Bible, even the stuff that is, you know, if you take except science, is very hard to accept. For example, not just the story of creation, but things like Jonah being swallowed by the whale and, and Joshua stopping the sun in the sky, uh, the God stopping the sun in the sky for Joshua, that all these stories are, you know, just run counter to God, uh, run counter to rational science, I should say and that once you start questioning the literal truth of the Bible, um, the literal truth of the creation story, uh, then you're on the road to immorality. And he writes, some are so wedded to evolution that they deny that God would perform a miracle because a miracle is inconsistent with evolution. In other words, to deny, to teach evolution, uh, to, is to basically question God's ability to perform miracles. And he writes down, and he says down here, Did God perform the miracles recorded in the Bible? The same evidence that establishes the authority of the Bible establishes the truth of the record of miracles performed. If anyone has been led to complain of the severity of the punishment that hangs over the defendant, and in fact, it was several months in jail for teaching this. It wasn't really that harsh a, a sentence. Let him compare this crime with its mild punishment with the crimes for which a greater punishment is prescribed. In other words, actually, he was not gonna, the fine that he would have to pay, as well as perhaps jail sentence, is nothing because it, 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 in day or night, in comparison with the crime of leading one away from God and away from Christ. So what he's saying is that, yes, whatever punishment we're going to give to John Scopes for teaching evolution is tiny compared to the punishment that he, the crime that he is inflicting. Because what he's inflicting is he is leading these young children, our children, he says, you know, the children of ordinary citizens, um, leading them away from God and away from Christ. And he's saying these liberal elitists, what he's kind of implying is that these liberal elitists are really trying to lead our young people, our, our children, our own children of ordinary, everyday Americans, leading them away from God and away from Christ and away from Christian morality. As he continues, he says, the soul is immortal and religion deals with the soul. The logical effect of the evolutionary hypothesis is to undermine religion and thus affect the soul. So, I mean, the stakes, again, could not be higher. I mean, the human soul, there's nothing more important than that. The eternal, one's eternal salvation is based on the state of one's soul, and evolution, teaching of evolution, undermines that. It, it undermines religion and thus affects the soul. The soul becomes... Uh, basically but it starts leaning towards the devil and devilish ideas and this will condemn this soul the souls of our young children our my own our own children will be condemned to hell and then he he talks here about a a, 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 a study that was done by a professor of psychology at Bryn Mawr College where they uh, interviewed uh, science professors uh, 5500 science professors and you know about their attitudes about God and about religion and the study, he said, is very alarming. Upon the answers received, he asserts that over, talking about James Luba, who conducted the study, asserts that over half of scientists teaching in our schools, teaching in our colleges, that is, teaching our young people, teaching our children, over half of them doubt or deny the existence of a personal God and a personal immortality. And he asserts that unbelief increases in proportion to predominance. So the higher up you go in the levels of college, uh, the more atheistic the professors become and the more dangerous they become. So again, it's this sort of idea that science is a threat to religion. It undermines religion. By undermining religion, it undermines moral values. And by undermining moral values, it threatens all of our eternal souls. Among biologists, believers in a personal God numbered less than 31%. In other words, more than two-thirds of people do not believe in a personal God, a God that intervenes in everyday life, and that uh, a God that uh, directs whether each of our souls goes to heaven or hell. 
He also talked about the influence of these professors at, at a bunch of colleges where he also uh, studies the students. And he says, the student statistics show that young people enter college possessed of all the beliefs still accepted, more or less perfunctorily, in the average home of the land. In other words, you know, the, the, these young people come out of high schools so and they still believe in God, and they still believe in, 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 in the literal truth of, of, of the Bible, and they still believe in all the morality uh, moral principles, the absolute eternal moral principles enunciated in the Bible, and gradually as they, they come under the influence of these college professors, they gradually abandon the cardinal Christian beliefs. This change from belief to unbelief he attributes to the influence of the persons of high culture under whom they studied. In other words, what he's citing this study is saying that, you know, uh, young people are very much threatened by the teaching of scientific principles that run counter to uh, biblical stories, the, the literal truth of the Bible, and of course evolution is the most important of these scientific principles, these threatening scientific principles. Now, of course, what Brian also says, and what many Christian fundamentalists believe, is not that there was no room for science in society. Obviously, there was. You know, people understood that radio, which everybody loved to listen to in the 1920s, this new technology, was based on scientific principles of, 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 of radio waves and all that sort of thing. So it wasn't that they were going to abandon science. Also, of course, all these public health measures that were increasing people's lives and making uh, and, and, and fighting disease, these were also based on scientific ideas um, that you know, people were, didn't want to throw out, they wanted to, to get the benefits of science. But what Brian says is that science needed to be kind of controlled and limited. It had to, it had, to, it had its role, but its role should not be in the realm of questioning biblical truth. And he says, science needs religion to direct its energies and to aspire with lofty purpose those who employ the forces that are unloosed by science. What he's saying is that science is this amoral thing. Yes, it's good when it does the right thing, when it provides new medicines or creates new technologies like radio, but that it needs the the moral principles of religion to make sure that science uh, operates in you know the public interest and he writes evolution on the other hand uh, you know that aspect of science is at war with religion because religion is supernatural it is therefore the relentless flow of Christianity which has revealed religion now progressives would have would have argued and Clarence Darrow did in fact argue that you know you can't pick and choose among science if you accept the idea that science some scientific uh, advances and truths are real, like radio waves or like mo modern ideas about the germ theory of disease. If you accept that, then you can't sort of say, well, I'm not going to accept evolution. Um, but from from uh, Brian's point of view and religious fundamentalist point of view, it's that science needs to be constrained. Um, that when it questions morality, we need to dispense with science. It can perfect machinery, like things like radio, you know, radios, but it adds no moral restraints to protect society from the misuse of the machine. Uh, and then at the end, he sort of uh, concludes with the world needs a savior more than it ever did before because of all this modernism, new ideas about sexuality, questioning of, of, of traditional morals as enunciated the Bible. We need uh, Jesus Christ more than ever, says, uh, uh, says Brian. And there's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In other words, what it says in the Bible that you can only go to heaven uh, through Jesus Christ. It is this name that evolution degrades. In other words, by accepting evolution, we are degrading God. We are degrading Christ's message because we are basically saying that human beings are no different from animals. We don't have a moral special place. We are not created in the image of God. We are simply the creation of the accidents of nature as, as through the evolutionary process. So carried to its logical conclusion, the evolutionary theory robs Christ of the glory of a virgin birth, again, because scientists would say that's not possible, right? It's irrational to imagine a woman getting pregnant without actually having sex, um, of the majesty of his de deity and mission and the triumph of his resurrection. Again, scientists, he would argue, are questioning whether resurrection is even possible. One of the most fundamental principles of the Christian religion is the resurrection of Christ, and science undermines that because it says, well, that doesn't accord with scientific principles. It also disputes the doctrine of atonement. In other words, uh, you know, because it undermines uh, moral absolutes, it undermines the idea that people should atone for their sins. Now, opponents of Brian and his viewpoints and, and the whole idea of, of banning evolution teaching in the public schools and fundamentalist Christianity uh, offended many urbanites, many liberals and, and, and progressives. Uh, one, of the, one of their leading spokesmen was a guy named H.L. Mencken. He was a popular journalist, author, kind of a professional cynic of the 1920s. Very funny guy, actually. He wrote for the Baltimore Sun. And he, of course, attended the trial in uh, Tennessee. And there he is sort of broadcasting over uh, uh, this uh, emerging network known as NBC. And of course, one of the things about the 
the Scopes trial that we should sort of back away and uh, back uh, take a step back and look at is that this was the first major trial that was carried by radio. Um, and so there were these radio broadcasters broadcasting from Dayton, Tennessee. So the whole country was kind of, for the first time, tuning into a single trial, um, not, not necessarily in real time. They didn't allow radio actually into the courtroom, of course. But, you know, after every session of time the court would take a break, these uh, broadcasters would go on the air, and all across America people were hearing about the latest developments in the case. So it was kind of this the, one of the first times when radio sort of demonstrated its power uh, to bring all of America together around a single story. The ultimate outcome of the Scopes trial was kind of ironic and, and there was some and, and tragic in a way. So the climax of the trial comes when Clarence Darrow decides to put William Jennings Bryan actually on the witness stand. This was an unprecedented move and a, a, a quite a, kind of a grandstanding move by Darrow. And what's unusual is that Bryan actually accepts it, uh, accepts this challenge. And you sort of realize how this trial had gone way beyond this one high school teacher in, in this small town in Tennessee. Um, that now the two, these two great lions of um, American public life, you know, this liberal progressive uh, civil libertarian named Clarence Darrow against this more traditionalist, uh, fundamentalist Christian Williams Jennings Bryan. But this trial had gone way beyond, as I said, uh, a simple case of a, of a small town high school teacher. And what's even more amazing is, you know, that Brian is brought to the stand, right, the, def the, the, the prosecutor is actually put on the stand by the defense lawyer, agrees to it, and they have this great confrontation. Um, and what Darrow begin, and, and what's really happening is the case is, again, spun way beyond what it was originally about. It was originally about, did a man, did this high school teacher, this young high school teacher, this biology teacher named John Scopes, did he teach evolution in public in a public school in Dayton, Tennessee, in contradiction of Tennessee law? I mean, that's really what the case ultimately at its base was about. But now, was a the, the, the case, the trial was becoming a, a, a sort of a trial about the Bible itself and about evolution itself and about what kind of country we were going to have. Um, that the stakes had grown way beyond. Uh, what the original crime had been about. And it was sort of a question of, you know, what is the meaning of the Bible? What is the role of Christianity in American life? And so when Darrow brings Brian onto the stand, um, he begins to sort of poke at, Darrow begins to poke at this sort of idea that the Bible is literally true. And he starts questioning um, that uh, he starts questioning Brian uh, on various points in the Bible. And, and so Darrow begins to sort of bring up some of the stories in the Bible that are run counter to scientific principles. So, for example, I mentioned these before. You know, he, he asks Brian about did Joshua, in fact, was, did God stop the sun uh, in response to Joshua's plea? Did, was Jonah, in fact, swallowed by the whale and how is that possible? And basically, Darrow's, uh, I mean, excuse me, Brian's responses to Darrow is look, if the Bible says it, it is true. It is absolutely true. And if it runs counter to scientific principle, so be it, because God is capable of violating scientific principles because he's God and he can perform all kinds of miracles. And then Darrow begins to sort of question Brian about um, the story of creation, which is, of course, at the heart of the issue of evolution. And at that point, Brian kind of makes a bit of a strategic error. In response to Darrow's questioning about was the world literally created in six days, Brian says, well, we have to understand the people of that time, you know, that they didn't really understand, um, you know, they didn't, that, that they, they spoke poetically, and this, of course, is exactly what uh, fundamentalists were supposed to be opposed to this idea that you could interpret the Bible, that it's not literally true. And he said, well, you know, the day could have been an epoch, it could have been an era, it could have been a much longer period, and that they, they use poetic license to describe it as a day. And of course, by admitting that, Brian was opening the door. He opened the door a crack to allow in the idea that the Bible is not quite literally true. Um, and that it's, you know, he is seen as sort of accepting uh, what those who, sort of the urban liberal uh, church uh, 
officials had been saying that you know you have you can't take the Bible as literally true that it is not this eternal thing that it has to be interpreted in what we understand about science and so he was kind of admitting uh, what those who were uh, supportive of teaching evolution in the public schools were arguing. Um, in the end, it didn't really matter. Um, because what the trial really came down to was, you know, there was this Tennessee law, as I said before, you know, that banned the teaching of evolution in public schools. Did John Scopes, in fact, teach education in the public schools? There were plenty of witnesses. All the children in the classroom saw it and heard it. Uh, the ACLU did, and, and the supporters of John Scopes didn't deny it. They said, in fact, it was true. What they were doing was trying to question the very law itself, which was a bit sort of legally speaking, a little bit uh, beside the point because, you know, you challenge laws, um, you know, in in the legislature, and of course you could probably bring it to the Supreme Court, but this particular case was a foregone conclusion. Scopes was, in fact, found guilty of teaching evolution in the public schools. So, but there was a sort of a bigger truth to all of this, um, and that was that what happened in this trial, that even though Scopes was found guilty, and by the way, he was fined a mere hundred dollars for his offense, and his supporters immediately paid it, so he paid no penalty uh, for violating Tennessee law. But what kind of emerged out of this trial gradually as America sort of grappled uh, with what the issues being raised was that it kind of the fundamentals for, among many Americans and in newspapers and, and in many urban areas and even many uh, uh, towns across America, smaller towns across America, um, Brian was made to look a bit like a figure of fun and his arguments be, sort of began to seem kind of ridiculous to many people and, and what, what, what happened was sort of the long-term outcome of this was that the fundamentalists were kind of embarrassed that they about, about the uh, the case itself and about the laws that they were passing to ban evolution. They seemed to be sort of fighting against the natural progress of America towards, uh, towards science and the acceptance of science and the acceptance of evolution. And it was seen as kind of a, a black eye and an embarrassment uh, to them. And what happened in the wake of this is that it's not that it undermined fundamentalist Christianity. Of course, that remained a, a, an important strain in American life. It didn't go away, of course, and sort of still course, a big part of, you know, there are uh, tens of millions of fundamentalist Christians today, um, as we talked about in terms of the culture wars, uh, many of them still, many of them involved in, in, in the many culture wars that we, we, we uh, have in America today. But what happened was, is there was a kind of retreat from public life for a while, um, that, that the, I, many fundamentalists beside, decided that, you know, they should return to the, sort of the, their churches and promote morality and traditional values within the churches, but to sort of stay out of the political sphere. Um, it wasn't just the teaching of evolution and, and, and uh, the sense many Americans had that the fundamentals were opposed to science itself um, that created this sort of sense that of embarrassment and that they should pull back from public life. And it was also, of course, prohibition. Uh, you know, it had been uh, prohibition had been promoted very heavily uh, by conservative Christians. Uh, they had they had pushed it uh, heavily and made it uh, the law of the land. And of course, prohibition by the mid nineteen twenties was being seen as a terrible. Uh, 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 it's an experiment that had gone terribly wrong and it promoted crime and violence um, and that you know you can't legislate morality you can't stop people from doing what they're going to already do you can't stop science in terms of teaching and public evolution and so there's kind of a retreat of fundamentalist Christians from public life for a number of decades they would reemerge as we're going to see later in this course they reemerge in the 1970s and 80s and re-enter public life as they see America again uh, see some of the value and, and, and liberal values and, and, and uh, sort of relative moral values that are, that, that, you know, sort of the rise of uh, the modern, uh, uh, with the sexual revolution of the 1960s and the women's movement of the 1970s and the hippies and all that, and the drug use and the rock and roll and all that stuff uh, of the 1960s and 70s. It creates a, a similar reaction to the 1920s and the modernism uh, of the 1920s, you see a, a similar reaction in the 1960s and 70s, and fundamentalists uh, re-emerge into public life then, but that's something we'll be talking about, about later. Um, as for the trial itself, it had sort of a tragic end about 
uh, five days, or I think it was about five days after the trial was over, Williams Jennings Bryan suffers a terrible heart attack uh, uh, while still in Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, he, the trial had put him under great strain. It took place in the summer uh, in Tennessee. It was extremely hot and humid throughout the trial. Um, and uh, William Jennings Bryan was not the, in, in great health to begin with. And, uh, you know, struggling in this trial day after day and, and, and the incredible um, strain that he was put under when put on the stand. And he sensed that, that America was turning away from him. You know, in the days, the, the immediate reaction to the trial was that, you know, he kind of looked ridiculous and the fundamentalist arguments against science began to look ridiculous and he began to feel like, um, you know, he had been on the sort of the wrong end of history and that he had embarrassed himself. And all of that strain uh, and the heat and the humidity, and of course this was an age before air conditioning, widespread air conditioning, um, you know, he suffered a heart attack and he, and he died shortly after the trial was over. Um, so you can see then from the Scopes trial just sort of what the stakes were in America in the 1920s, the struggle between this new modernist ideas uh, that were coming forward in terms of culture and society and science and the reaction that it created. Uh, next time, we're going to look at the 1920s uh, 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 more economically and look at what are the economic factors um, that uh, were in place in the 1920s uh, that ended up leading to the Great Crash and the Great Depression and then the New Deal that followed. So we'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.